<clears throat> All right. Well, it's uh, Saturday night, which is the best time for me to be talking to my next brother from another mother. Um, I uh, wanted to just let anybody know that's watching tonight that if you don't already know this amazing human being, um, Joff Metz and I met over a decade ago uh, when he was traveling with his successful band, Western Ariel. At that point, he was still working at a guitar shop at Five Star Guitars, he had not yet become a burgeoning business owner, taking over Five Star with his partners. Uh, but he's gone on to win several awards for that business. He's also a founding member and primary um, singer, songwriter for Mets Ryan and Collins, the rock and trio here in Portland, and Ants in the Kitchen, which is a really cool, big, solid rock and review band. And um, aside from all those things, uh, one of the dearest people that I've met on the planet, I love to be able to share these things with you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have Joff Metz. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Uh, how you doing? Thanks, thanks for having me on. I, I see you do a couple of these, and I, I was telling the story earlier today. Um, you know, like I'd seen some of the people that you'd had on. I was like, ah, you know, Kevin knows a bunch of cool people. And uh, so then, when you asked me to do this, I was like, like, well, at the top of the list, right? <laughs> it, it, you know, okay. So you and I both are um, were people that sort of gravitate towards positive, driven, tenacious, uh, creative people. And I'm just, I'm astounded by the amount of people that I have like that in my life, right? Between the web business that I have and also playing locally in bands with you and other friends here <clears throat> and, and traveling on the road, right? So like all across this freaking planet, I've met people that anyway, they inspire me and I wanted to just hang out and be able to catch up with people. A lot of like you and I, you and I could sit down and we'll talk for hours at a time. And it's like, we'd never left, but we're busy. And this is a time right now, right? Where there's a little bit of time and an opportunity to kind of share anecdotes and fun stories. You've got so much going on even right now that I think you could actually benefit by sharing some information with people about how you've been sustainable with the business, but we're going to get to that. All okay. Right. Um, but in, in so doing with it, getting, guests, if you will, my friends together on this thing. It's really meant as a lighthearted way to just have conversation and there are no rules. You, know, you don't have to wear pants, it doesn't even matter. I um, What I'm hoping to do, <laughs> I know it'd be, it's like old times with us, right? <laughs> but, uh, but I want to, um, I, I want uh, really to be able to share some sort of light spirited, you know, conversation and give, you know, a little uh, distraction to people that might be going through a rough time right now. So. That's why we're here, right? Right on. And uh, there's a lot to cover. And I think um, I, I would love to start at least just getting uh, people familiar with your heritage. I know that you came from Idaho and you got a family back there. So what brought you, what brought you to Portland from Idaho? Uh, well, I was, I was going to school in Moscow and after I graduated, it's like one of those, those things where it's a really small college town there's not, I mean, unless you're working for the university, you know, or one of those ancillary businesses, there's not much to do. Like the music school was cool, you know, and, and it was a great scene and I was, I was playing a lot and it was really cool. Um, but I also knew that I couldn't stay there, you know, like not if you really want to do it, you got to move someplace bigger, which is with more uh, opportunities. Yeah. So I had some family in the area and one of my really good buddies um, had gotten a job out here like in January of 2000, December, something like that. Okay. <clears throat> so he, um, he invites me out. He's like, hey man, I just got a job in Portland. You wanna come out? I had a lease up to like the end of May, 2000. So this would have been like December, 2019, whatever. Point be it, I just kind of took it as a sign. I was like, I didn't wanna move back to Boise. And I was kind of looking like, well, maybe Seattle, it's a cool town. Portland's cool, I've, I've been there a number of times. And then, you know, beyond that, like LA or San Francisco or whatever, I just, I just really wanted to play some music and give that a go. And so uh, when my buddy got a job here, I was like, okay, cool. And so a few months later, when my uh, lease ran out, I moved out here, it's like with a U-Haul and like, 500 bucks or something yeah. like like back when you could do that and it was right. like 
It's like 500 bucks, you know? Right. No, no responsibilities, but you didn't have any gigs lined up, any jobs or anything like that? <clears throat> didn't. And then that was kind of the weird thing too. Like, it doesn't matter like how connected you were, or, you know, what cool shows you were playing in Moscow, Idaho. Like when you get here, it's kind of like, nobody cares, right? right. And nobody knows any of those places. And it's, it, you know, it's not that they don't care. It's just, you know, how would they know? Right. So it took a minute to kind of get oriented. So, you know, I was just like living on my buddy's couch and I got a job, which was actually looking back at it like a pretty decent job. Um, you know, but I took a job working for this architecture firm because I didn't really have any prospects to make any money playing music. Not certainly not right away. So I started doing like the open mic night thing, you know, and all those, all those places that were around at the time. I mean, you know, and some of them that are still around, like um, I think the Dublin pub was the first paying gig. That right. I and just you and a guitar. Yeah. I went there and did like the Wednesday night, um, you know, 20 minute uh, open mic night thing. And, and that was, you know, it, it was a cool way to integrate into the scene and get a chance to play and, um, you know, so that it was a good thing, but I remember I brought out like a dozen friends that I'd cobbled together, just that I'd met in the first couple of months. They came out and Katie, you know, or yeah. oh, yes. I, I, you know, I like what you're doing up there. How'd you like to come back on, you know, a Friday night? And so I'd like sign this little contract <laughs> and, and I think I'm, you know, I got like 50 bucks or something. Wow. For 20 minutes set. Um, well, no, no. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, like an hour and a half or something gotcha all right that was one of the things too you know i was like uh you know do you have that much material and of course like yeah i will yeah. right so um anyway yeah i mean i really just tried to network my way in and i and that's kind of how you kind of how you have to do it just go see a lot of shows and you never know when you're going to meet people that wind up being a big part of your life you know yeah like you or, you know, all the guys, like we were just talking off camera before this started about how we met and like our mutual friend, Julie said like, Hey, Joff, you should know Kevin, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you just never know. I mean, yeah. like, you know, like, Hey, cool. Nice to meet you and whatever. But you can't anticipate, like nobody could know that we would wind up doing all this crazy stuff together and still be friends all these years later. You know? We truly have done some crazy stuff together, man. Uh, you know, you, you talk about nobody would know, but I think that a lot of people might show up in a new town trying to break into a music scene without any ability to network. And you've got the ability to just walk into a room and make friends instantly. You know, that's a gift, right? That's not just a, you know, a skill that you've honed, but that's something that you've got inside. But hey, I bet you've talked to people about this, right? That ask you god how is it that you can walk into a room and walk out of there with five new friends how is it that joff Metz? is it even a conscious thing or is it just something that happens with you um i don't know i mean just being willing to talk to people you know and just speak genuinely and not be too i guess nervous about it whatever you know yeah, I'm just, any... I'm just being a nice person i don't know but I, I, you 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 know you seem like that's no big deal but it is a huge deal for a lot of people you know? <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's one of those things that like, I remember taking like speech class in high school. I, I, in, in going through that class, that's when I realized that it was not a big deal for me to get up in front of people like that and talk, you know? And I mean, I, I looking back and of course I was already courting the attention by, you know, whatever it was goofing off in the back of the class anyway. But you know, I had like a really easy time with that. Yeah. And I did meet people that really struggled, that really, yeah. you know, were insecure about being in front of people and didn't want to be seen. And, and you could see like if they stumbled on a word, they would, you know, it could just be this downward spiral where they, yeah. and, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose it's those kind of things. Like they're just, you know, certain personalities like you, man, I'm like, you're my go-to. I'm like <laughs> able to walk into a room and just sort of meet anybody and do the thing. And I've, I've seen you do it. Like there have been times where like I was nervous, you know, I'd be like, 
whoa, uh, I'll tell you like, best example of that, like, I guess I recall, this was so like suave and so cool. <laughs> You know, like we're one of those NAM parties and there's just, you know, it's filled with industry people. And so, you know, look, like you just see famous musicians and stuff. We're standing there and I was like, oh man, it's, it's Mickey D from Motorhead. And he's like, I, or, you know, you're like, um, well, you, you want to meet him? And I'm like, do you know him? He's like, no, let's go meet him. So you just like walked up and like, hey, Mickey. <laughs> and so like you were so <laughs> natural and like you know it was so organic the way that it happened that he just you know kind of turned and was like oh hey you know and, and did the thing you're like ah it's my buddy Josh hey what are you drinking Mickey he was like oh Heineken and so you, you buy two Heinekens and next thing I know I'm having a beer with Mickey D and like you split the I don't know do whatever you're doing but there I was and it was just that easy for you no like a natural in those kind of environments uh well Disarming people with a smile is one thing, right? I mean, you walk in and and without any agenda or any ulterior motive, you genuinely just want to meet somebody. It seems like it's a little bit easier, right? Uh, other than the guys that are there at the NAM parties that are trying to network and hook up, and you can see them just waiting to give you the business card, right? They just like can't wait to tell you how important they are, <laughs> and those people just you know they get laughed out of the room, man. But um, one thing I noticed about you, when you're speaking, I've seen you do this. Oh my God, you've gone to Congress and you've you know worked to lobby for music education. You've uh, helped host music, like uh, uh, Oregon Music Hall of Fame events, right? Where you were acting director for a while. And, and there were millions of brand new strange people that you had never met before that you were so comfortable and confident. And that confidence, it's not arrogant. And uh, and I'm, this is really Amanda's, uh, I think it's an important thing to kind of share with other people. My kids talk about it a lot. It drives them nuts that I'm such a talker, right? I mean, they, they can't go someplace without me getting stuck talking to somebody. But, um, you know, I think I may have told you this before. Um, Jim Carrey did this commencement speech a bunch of years ago, right? And at the end of this speech, he talked to this group of business students about the effect you have on others is the greatest form of commerce there is or greatest form of currency, sorry, that there is. And I thought about that a lot, right? Because that's the way that I think people walk away when they meet you, um, whether they're doing business at Five Star, right? Or um, you're talking to congressmen about music education, right? Everybody's trying to go after the dollars and you're trying to sell the value of music education to these people in order to help you know, a lot of kids in the future. And um, all those kind of, things behind your um, conversation don't have ulterior motives other than you're just trying to communicate a positive point. You know, it comes off very sincere. And well, I think it makes it a lot easier and it makes it, you know, sincere for me when it's things that I really believe in. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, and so like Omhoff's one of those where it's like, oh, you know, what a great organization. What a cool, you know, group. I, I always talk about it like, you know, kind of the right people doing the right thing. Yeah, And so, you know, I had a, a great experience uh, working with those guys and, and still want to support however I can, but I can talk genuinely about that. And the same way with like music education, like when the times that I've been back to talk with uh, Congress about that, about um, increasing federal funding for music education, uh, you know, especially the first time, I get a little nerve wracking. Yeah. That... You know, I was mean, like sort of that feeling of like, are they really going to let me talk here? You know, yeah, like, right. am I really the best guy for the job? Um, so, you know, I think if it was just somebody asking me to talk about like an infrastructure package or, you know, something I don't really know anything about or don't have, you know, I don't really feel uh, as tied to it. I, I don't know that I could. Yeah. You know? And certainly not speak with any genuineness, which I, I think is the thing, you know, like, yeah. You can have conviction if you really believe in something. You bet. But, um, you know, with those sort of things, like wholeheartedly, you know, like uh, music's been like my favorite thing for a long time. And I feel really fortunate, especially like in Portland. I started thinking about this earlier today. I, this month, I've been living in Portland for 20 years. Wow. And it's, it's been a great ride i've gotten a chance to do so many like really cool things that when i moved here in that u-haul i was like man you know i i had some things that i hoped would happen and many many of those things 
did come to pass and, and a lot of other things that I couldn't have anticipated. You know, and I just made a lot of great friends and all this kind of thing. So, you know, over the last few years, especially like, you know, being a little bit more involved in the, the music scene and just being in a spot in my life where I could give back a little bit more, you know, that's, it's been nice to, to be at that spot and say like, all right, I wanna, you know, kind of pass it down, like make sure that, you know, other people have the opportunity uh, to, to do this. And that these things that I think are really important stay around and get the funding yeah. that they need so that, that they're around for the next, the next guy with the U-Haul truck and, you know, around. It's huge. I mean, you know, uh, we've seen schools just having their education programs wiped out, you know, and one of the things that I've been blown away by is the amount of energy and passion that Amy Richter's put in with Music Workshop. And so she's got this whole incredible music program in a box, right, that has gone worldwide. Every single state has a bunch of these programs and uh, a lot of these instructional or these informative videos have, I've seen you in them, right? So they've got some really great features of you it's the perfect person, right? Because you, uh, you and I have been on camera before, right? We've, uh, we could probably talk about the elephant in the room. One of the promo pictures that I used to promote your uh, your event tonight was uh, the experience with Ron Jeremy, right? Yeah, um, yeah, that's you were talking talk about talk a little bit about bucket uh, list item checked, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, that you know the, the way that that went down was there was this. Uh, film company called cheesy flicks that made this movie called um oh, you're telling um called stripper land it was all filmed yeah yeah there you go on netflix treat yourself <laughs> uh so anyway they they were looking for like a theme song and they um wound up liking the song that uh, that we wrote you and i and we recorded it it was super cool. And as part of the, the compensation for it, they wanted to do a, a video, you know, that, that we could use to promote our record because it wound up coming out on our record as well as the, uh, the DVD. So they initially, we were talking about this and they wanted it to be, it's like, it's like about zombie strippers, right? And they, they had this idea of like the band in a bar that, you know, hiding out from these zombies outside or something. And I was like, ah. How about this? How about, you know, like I knew somebody that worked there and I knew that Ron had done a couple of films and I just thought it would be cool. And I'm like, well, how about a shot for shot remake of Here I Go Again by Whitesnake and I want Ron Jeremy in it. Yeah. And like, you know, after they sort of composed themselves, because I think it kind of shocked them. I was like, oh, no, I'm serious. Like, really, let's do that. And uh, they were like, okay, well, uh, how, what about the zombie angle? I'm like, all right, just make the tiny contain a zombie. Problem solved. Let's, you know. Um, so we got a chance to do it. And they, they brought Ron in. So like, you know, we filmed the rest of the video separately. And they brought us into, uh, uh, it was Club Sesso at the time. Right. His Swingers Club. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, it was called like Ron Jeremy's Club Sesso or something. That's he right. his name to it. Well, we, you know, when you watch that video, it's us at a bar. And then, you know, we, we interact with Ron, but the way it actually went down was, you know, he came in afterward and I, I read lines to him off screen and it was such a blast. Like, you know, he's, he's a character, like, you know, nice enough guy, but it just seemed like such a, like, I, I don't know, I guess just the, the fact that if you wanted to make like a rock video, it was like, yeah, like what's cool? Like, well, when I was a kid, it was White Snake, And when I got a little bit older, it was movies that may or may not have started. <laughs> so, um, you know, like, and that's how it went down. And, and there we were just talking with him and, you know, it was cool. And then we, we ran into him in, in LA, like six months later, like not that long after. Right. And, <laughs> and, and he couldn't remember a thing yeah. about it. Not a thing. Right. Yeah. But, but, but you remember before that, I had met him down in LA years before, remember? Because he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah he, he, he was a little inebriated at the cat club telling me, man, I wish I had, I wish I hadn't left music, uh, education. He was a special needs teacher. And he said, I really wish I would have uh, 
but still continued to teach. I, I made a difference with kids' lives. And I said, well, you're doing all your PETA spokesperson stuff, right, for your charity. It seems like you could do something, you know, you could go back and do something with your charity that'd be fulfilling. <coughs> and, I, and I thought about it on the flight home. I thought, what if we just kind of, because he talked about the uh, the religious right crucifying him. You know, once he started getting involved in, in uh, adult films, then they crucified him. And he said, I could never go back to education. And so I thought, what if we took the What Would Jesus Do logo and changed to WWRJD to use the same font, kind of make a little, poke a little fun at it, and then any proceeds that might go from the merchandise sales to go to his charity. And he, I pitched it to him and he said, yeah, man, let's do it. Now, maybe not so much charity, but we'd split it 50-50. And then I saw him shortly after, I drew things up with an attorney just to write things down and, and split those things up and completely forgot what I, we talked about, even though he'd even signed this, right? So then when you said, hey, we should get Ron Jeremy, I said, I just happen to have his number. Let's give him a call. And, <laughs> and I remember talking to him about the merchandise at the video shoot, completely clueless about what had happened, you know, when we signed this whole field over. Then when you and I ran into it at the NAMM show, we're down at the Rainbow, right? Yeah. And we went over to talk to him. He didn't remember anything about the music video, even though he had some, <laughs> pivotal parts in the music video that I think he was entertained by one of the uh, the gals in the video. Yeah. Remember, right? Like she brought her boyfriend down and yeah, I don't know how much we want to talk about that, but then I saw him again. Uh, our friend Alex Hart ran, we were down to the show that I was doing at the rainbow again. And Ron comes over and says, Hey man, what's up? And I thought he was going to talk to me about the merch or the video. And he finally remembered, but now he said, Hey, you park my car. No, he said, eating a milk out back. You know? He said, "Can I get a slice of your pizza?" I'm like, "What the hell, man?" So, I um, yeah, and I, you know, thankfully Ron's still around. I guess he had an aneurysm a couple years ago and drove himself to the hospital after having an aneurysm, and uh, and is apparently still alive and kicking doing the biz. So, Ron, if you're out there, uh, maybe we can have a chance to have one of these conversations, and you can remember, you can tell me how much you remember about the music video that we did with Job. <laughs> But, and I don't think his, his club's around anymore, right? I think uh, prior to the pandemic, club went out of business, right? Yeah, it's, it's changed hands. There's no more, uh, I mean, I, I think it's still the same type of business, uh, but uh, different. Oh, oh, okay. All right. And, and, and no uh, endorsement from Ron, so. No, oh, yeah. Alas. Man, I, one thing I really do often when you and I have conversation is spin off into a million different directions. So I'm going to try and contain this to maybe some fun anecdotes, but you've done some remarkable things just recently, right? I can get a little heavy and just talking about right now, our circle of people, tons of self-employed musicians and people that are small business owners, yeah. they've been hit hard, right? Man, the world is upside down right now with this pandemic. <clears throat> and you and I talked about it a little bit. But one thing I know with you, when, um, when the industry itself, the music industry changed where music merchandising became really polarized, right? And so the big chain music stores, the guitar centers, if you will, really did a work over on these small business owners, right? But they just, very few of them could stay in business unless they had a tiny niche and their ability to kind of have any market share was next to nothing. Kind of, kind of like Walmart did with all the- Exactly. Know, hardware stores or you know that kind of thing um, but, but something happened with you when you took over that business I mean it was remarkable because not only did you make it a successful business but there was recognition that went along with it so kind of talk a little bit about that transition and what made five stars so much different from these other stores that couldn't succeed um well you know it was a pretty small shop when I first walked in there uh within the first like week or two of moving here um, I had some gear left over from my, my band's PA, right? So I needed to get rid of that. And um, so I, I wound up meeting the, the founder, the guy who had started it in 98. Um, and it was just this little place on the edge of town, but it was close to where I was living at the time. And, you know, super nice guy and um, got to know him. And, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, I wound up getting a job just part-time, you know, so I was, I was working downtown just doing the thing. And then I got the opportunity to work at this music store on the weekends. And it was a great way to meet people and super cool. And I really liked the environment. I always liked music stores. Right? Yeah. So were you, were you selling or teaching? What was your role there? 
I was just selling just, just right. um, like Saturdays at first. And, uh, you know, really enjoyed that and kept doing it. Um, started teaching there. So I, I'd been doing that in, in Moscow too. And, uh, and that was really good. And eventually started working there full time, just teaching and, uh, you know, helping out like uh, run the store. And so in 2011, as things were starting to kind of slow down for the band, you know, the opportunity came up to buy the shop with two other longtime employees, uh, my partners, Jeep and Jeremy. And it was really cool, you know? I mean, like, I, I knew that it was, a, it was a cool business that I really enjoyed. I'd worked there, you know, by then five years, which was like the longest I'd ever worked anywhere. And, uh, you know, it was, it was cool. And it seemed like there was an opportunity there. And so we, we, we kind of vetted that to see if, if we could really make it work. Um, you know, and we decided that we could. And, you know, right away we started trying to really revamp things. I and mean, you can imagine like working at a business and having ideas about how, you know, you, you could make things better. But then all of a sudden you're, you're in the driver's seat. You know, one day, like the, actually the decision rests with you about right. that. So we worked really hard and you know, we started um, it just, you know, doing the, uh, the, the lesson scheduling online instead of I mean, lose things golden paper, right? Yeah. And have like file drawers of that stuff. And <clears throat> started selling stuff online and, you know, just re-merchandising, doing all the stuff. And it was really exciting. And again, like, if it wasn't for the fact that I really love musical instruments and love being surrounded by musicians in like a, a guitar shop environment, it's like perfect. It's like my natural habitat, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, like, if it weren't for that, like, I don't know that if it was just selling vacuum cleaners or something, I don't know that it'd be the same. Um, but I, I realized that I, I just loved doing that. And it, it was a really cool opportunity for me because I've certainly had jobs that I didn't love that weren't inspiring yeah. and, you know, it's, it's not about the, the money um, completely, you know, I mean, you, you know, we want to make enough to, to get by, but you know, it, it was just yeah. a really good fit. And, you know, I had all this uh, experience playing music and teaching and I, you know, I had a business degree and I'd been working at the shop for a long time and I just seemed like I was uniquely qualified you know, just after a few years of what seemed like maybe random things, but all kind of came together with that. I was like, oh, this is like, I can do this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we went about it. We had to be really conservative, you know, like be really careful that we didn't, um, you know, overspend or like, you know, with any small business, there's a yeah. thousand ways that you can screw it up and be yeah. bankrupt and, and all your employees, uh, you know, they're counting on you for yeah. And their families are counting on you. They, you know, you, you screwed up. But we we managed to make the cut every time, and we expanded into two stores, and then consolidated just uh, three and a half years ago into the place we're at now. And it's a, a bigger than both those two were, and it allowed us to really just expand. You know, we had the room to work. We had we could offer more lessons. We had a bigger repair department. Um, you know, for the first time ever, we got to build out like the, the floor plan of it. <clears throat> and I remember going in there like in this empty building and putting like masking tape down, you know, we'd measure it out so that we could sort of see like, you know, have a visual with how big the rooms were. And, you know, even putting chairs in the lesson rooms, like, okay, well, if it's, you know, nine by 10, is this enough? Is it, you know, or is it too close? Is it weird? Right. You know, and, but it was super exciting. And, not even thinking about having six feet distance between customers that, <laughs> right. sorry. <clears throat> Here's where that comes into play. Um, you know, we, we'd gotten some recognition like industry wise and that was, that was really cool. It meant a lot because we were working hard and you know, we've had a lot of support and you know, the staff is great and a lot of support from a lot of customers for a lot of years. And you know, it's been a wonderful experience and we're always just trying to make sure that we, you know, 
we're going to honor that. Like that if somebody refers somebody to us, that we'll take care of them and, and take a long-term view of the customer, not just like, well, how much you know, crap can I sell you today? How much money you got on you? Right. <clears throat> but more of the like, you know, if we take care of people, they'll keep coming back. Yeah. Well, as long as we keep that up and, and, you know, do what we say and, you know, all that kind of stuff that, that we could do it. And, and we had, uh, and things were going really well for us. And we were starting to like, you know, really gain some traction. Um, you know, we were selling more and more stuff online and things were really going. And then I remember um, it was like the middle of March this year. We had done three nights of a student concert where we get the students together playing some music. It's, you know, it's a really cool program that's evolved over the years. <clears throat> and um, I looked up, there was an NBA game on and they were ushering people out. Mm. That's when I knew. And like, we'd all seen these things, but like that for me was like when they shut down that NBA game and said that the rest of the season was postponed, like it's over, I thought, wow you know like here is a billion dollar business right you know huge and they're saying the money's not as important as safety we need to put a lid on this right now right and so you know we kind of scrambled over the next couple of weeks it seemed like every day we were trying to figure out like how are we going to make this work like um and and everybody looking to us my partners and i like what's it going to be we thought we could keep some people on eventually like we, we, we furloughed everybody. I mean, we moved all the, uh, the lessons to online. We did everything that we could. And for the last like six weeks, it's been just my partners and I, the three of us wow. in this big empty store, you know, that just seems so big when there's nobody there. And we're trying to like take every phone call and like we're in every hat, right? Yeah, like I'm right. Cash and opening boxes and whatever. Cause like, it's me. Yeah. And um, so not only is, is May the, the anniversary, uh, Ken couldn't remember the exact date. So we just use the entire month, but we, we call it May 1st, was the 22nd anniversary of uh, Five Star Guitars. Wow. And it also was the first day that we brought a couple of employees back. Um, this, year, this year, two days ago, yesterday. 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 Yeah, yeah. And so that was a, that was a huge step forward for us in the yeah. movement. Um, you know, we'd stayed in touch with everybody and, but you know, we weren't sure what to do. It's been difficult to navigate. Um, and so, you know, that meant a lot and, and it's been great this, this weekend, you know, like uh, just sort of reflecting on that. It's like, yeah, not over by any means, but we had two guys. We're going to start bringing more guys on um and we get to we get to be in business for at least another month yeah okay so you're in uncharted territory right i mean everybody that owns a business right now or anybody that has family that's been affected by this there's there's not a rule book that says this is what you do when this happens right that's why government agencies are faltering over the ways to deal and <laughs> medical, you know really um yeah. but the the chance for you to bring two people back and kind of get things right, riding the ship a little bit. It didn't just come randomly. This is part of some tenacity that you had. Um, I know that I know personally as a business owner, right? The, uh, the challenge of trying to get any kind of government assistance to help sustain your business. Um, everybody's kind of going through it, whether you're filing for unemployment or you're looking for the PPP sort of paycheck protection plan, all those things were new territory they're kind of uncomfortable for people to even ask for assistance. They don't know where to go. There's some misinformation that was happening about which lending institutions to go after. Oh, no. What, like, like how much of this was you just rolling up your sleeves saying, I need to make this thing work, not only for me, but for my people to get back to this point where you're at least bringing some people back in. What, <clears throat> tell me about that step. Well, uh, I really gotta you know, credit my partners on this. Uh, Jeremy Murphin, who's our CFO, is, um, you know, like brilliant uh, with the numbers. And so he, he's also, I mean, we've been involved with the Chamber of Commerce for a long time, but he's actually on the board for the Hillsborough Chamber of Commerce. And um, so okay. it's been great. I mean, that's, that's a volunteer position for him. But the great thing about it is that, you know, we've 
I've had the opportunity to really network with the folks that are in the know. And so we dedicated time. And, and I remember saying to Jeremy, I was like, dude, like this is the priority. Whatever time you need, like, don't worry about it. I'll take out the trash and I'll open yeah. the boxes. You know, because with the, the ever-changing list of priorities, that was number one. Yeah. We wanted to check in. I mean, if there was any sort of stimulus available, that's the difference between like life and death for that. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, and it, the tough thing is it's not, you know, we're not in trouble. None of these businesses are in trouble because they mismanage their funds or they right. were the wheel. These are people that are working hard, but nobody could have seen this coming. No, nope. you can't really plan for this. And, you know, moving forward, I think it'll be a, a different world, but like, I don't know, January, February, I wasn't thinking about that. Right. You know, I mean, we're just, we're, we're, you're in the midst of doing it and you've mm -hmm. got plans of what March, April, May, what third quarter, fourth quarter, you're already looking into it. And then this thing happens, you're just like, okay, well, I guess I'll take my lunch hour and try to find a hand sanitizer. Like, right. you know, like uh, I mean, that kind of stuff. We're, we're like, usually when prior to this, start the day and you kind of know like, all right, here's what I want to get done. And here's who I'm going to talk to. And, you know, you try to check everything off the list. But this was different in the sense that you start the day, you think it was going to go one way. And by the end of it, you're, you're on a complete, like what you were going to do is yeah. irrelevant. Right. It doesn't matter if it even gets done. Right. You got to decide, you know, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. And, and one of the, one of the most difficult things about that too, was knowing that we were going to have to, to furlough people. Um, you know, I, nobody wants to do that. Like it's of course. Them to, uh, to do that. But you know, we, we, realized that that was the best thing for them was the best thing for us you know and that my partners and i agreed then that we would just work we would do everything that we could the three of us um to keep the thing running until we could get the guys back and so uh anyway yeah it's it's been really challenging and i would say exciting but it's also frightening you know yeah. and you know, like the, I don't, I don't envy legislators, the banks. I mean, like they're trying to do a lot in a really quick time frame. Could it be better? Certainly. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, I like to think that their, their intentions are good, you know, but it's a pretty big ask of people to do it. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, we, we, had a relationship with our, our bank that was one of the lending institutions. We just kind of like lucked out on that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we'd worked with this, these guys before and they'd helped us, uh, given us a loan to uh, build out our current building and stuff. So, you know, we knew them. And as soon as we heard about it, we're like, Hey, you know, we we're just on it. We made it a priority. And, you know, it, even that's not necessarily enough, but we managed to get in and then, they'd run out of funds, right. 350 billion with a B dollars in like a week or whatever. And was like, all right, what's gonna happen now, you know? And, it, you know, we're running like all these different scenarios and, and it's getting really, uh, like really tense, not between my partners and I, but but just, it's, it's rough. Yeah. And, you, know, you got it in the back of your mind, like, well, I guess if it all, you know, you start thinking like, well, I, in, in all these years of trying to expand and trying to like think about the next move to, you know, uh, make it run smoother, but also run in kind of perpetuity. You know, they're like, mm -hmm. like I would love for this neighborhood to have a great music store forever. Yeah. Um, to then looking at it and like, well, how do we, you know, what happens if we have to shut it down? Yeah. You know, you start really you know, reading like your lease and saying like, well, okay, so what does happen if we don't pay? Smart, yeah. You know, um, and what is, we, you know, we had to look at a lot of things and it, it wasn't much fun. Not nearly as much fun as like, hey, let's, you know, let's take on the world together. Right. Yeah, next quarter we're gonna, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the exciting part. Yeah. So we did it. Um, you know, thus far. And, and I mean, it feels good. We did everything that we could do, a lot of stuff out of our control, of course. But, uh, you know, recently I'm, I'm not 
I wouldn't say I'm seeing like a light at the end of the tunnel, but like I'm seeing forward movement, like positive movement. You bet. <clears throat> Getting employees back in so that like, I, you know, we're, we're probably not going to open to the public for another week at least because there's a lot of stuff that we have to do now to operate with, with the appropriate social distancing. I mean, like, you know, to, to do it safely and to make sure that the staff's aware and to, you know, get the word out to customers and, and vendors and everybody that like, okay, here's the plan moving forward. We have to be really careful not to get overloaded with products or anything because you don't know what it's going to be like. Um, right, sure. But, but it's, um, I don't know, like, I also have to take like a, a day like today and just be sort of grateful, you know, like, hey, like it's moving forward, things are good. And, you know, that, that would be the first step to getting out of this and getting back to, you know, making, uh, you know, getting guitars in people's hands. Yeah. You know, while nobody had this sort of uh, concept of contingency plan to come up with a way to uh, be sustainable, right? With a pandemic, a global pandemic. But one thing that happened sort of in an organic or natural fashion for you, I know, is when all those big chain stores like the, the guitar centers in the, of the world were taking away business for a lot of the small business owners, you gravitated towards doing more e-commerce online, being able to get your guitars out there online. And it was a really natural progression to watch the, the, uh, this um, trajectory of success that Five Star had, where you, at that same point, really started opening up your lessons, right? Like lessons became a real integral part of the Five Star. And what, one thing that I think just makes it, uh, uh, it sets it apart from other businesses is that you made education be equally important as the actual merchandising of your product. And it's, I think, you know, maybe self-serving, right? That it keeps people coming back in and want to buy guitars and they're there for a bit. But I know that there was a deep seated need and uh, want to have people understand their craft, love and, and nurture their craft. And uh, that's why you started doing the student recitals and these live performance pieces as an opportunity to not to have them practice at home, but yeah. to get out in front of people, right? And, and I, um, so that, it was almost, in my eyes, a little contingency plan, right? Where you were able to not only offer lessons and also monetize your merchandising through the internet, but in a way, it kind of helped pave a little path for what's what happened now in the future, right? I think you mentioned you're doing Zoom lessons and, and live uh, lessons, at least through the web. Yeah, on, on various platforms, you know, okay. we opened it up to whatever worked for people. Um, and we had to make quick decisions about like how that would be done how we could how we could help you know like keep the infrastructure like help the instructors do their thing from home <clears throat> i'm so glad that we did because you know the the lessons will probably continue for a while mm -hmm. with the home i mean we're, we're trying to figure that out but you know one we're so lucky that this is happening in 2020 and not like 1998 because right. this technology just didn't exist right you, you know at best, it would have been expensive and clunky. And, you know, the, the lessons would have just stopped. Yeah. So we were able to keep that going. And, you know, and I, I'm still teaching a couple afternoons a week. Um, and it's great. You know, and look, the reason that we have lessons is because, like, one, it's a sort of a symbiotic relationship with the other stuff. You know, we do a lot of repairs and stuff. But, like, guitar lessons at a store are not unlike like this one changed my life as a kid and you know that i don't know like the sort of the history of that you know the people being able to get their questions answered and, and get help yeah. you know they want to play music but you know it's it's hard to reinvent the wheel you know you can't just give a kid a piano and be like hey play something go, go for it yeah yeah it's not as like a like a toy truck or something like man yeah, vroom vroom you know like you, you gotta it, it's a lot easier if somebody can just help you. Yeah. And so that's, it's super rewarding. I mean, beyond money. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a part of it too, is like if we can help foster that community and help people achieve what they want, be able to get the, the sound out of their head and, you know, out of the speaker, 
um, then I don't know. I mean, feel like we made the world a better place. Yeah. For me, you know, I, I still think back to like all those guitar shops I used to go to, like in Boise or Moscow or whatever. And, you know, like those were great places. It was a really cool environment. And, you know, I'm not really in contact with those guys necessarily. Um, you know, it was a long time ago, but I would imagine they would be super proud of, of what I'm doing. You know? Oh, undoubtedly. And, and uh, you know, like, I, I really feel like there's been a lot of cooperation, not only, uh, I feel like we have a good relationship with everybody in town, you know, I and mean, we know all those guys. I'm, you know, I was just at Strum for a, a Music Portland event, got a chance to meet up with those guys, you know, it was cool. And I love yeah. going to those jobs. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of cooperation in this time in the music industry. Like when I talked to my vendors and I had to say like, hey, don't send me any guitars right now. Yeah. I know that we had stuff, but like, you know, like just, I don't know what's gonna happen. You just give me a minute. They were so cool. There, were, there was no like, hey, look, you committed to that. You know, right. everybody was cool. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, how that goes coming out. But I think that's what, what this country needs right now is a yeah. lot of population. Because if we can work on this together, um, we can avoid harming each other more than we have to. Yeah. You know, um, the difference between some places going out of business, you know, or coming back into business, however you want to think of it, versus um, yeah, like, like being able to make it and not is everybody working with them. You know, whether it's the the landlord offering, you know, uh, some rent abatement or whatever it is that, to to keep the retailer going, just like in the residential market. Sure. And I I I just I hope that nobody loses sight of that. You know, because it's the cooperation and the the sort of empathy and the willingness to work together and recognizing that a strong economy like is important for us all. Absolutely. Not, like if I'm the only, you know, music store, that's not necessarily a good thing. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it works well when everybody is healthy. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's what I'm looking forward to doing. I did not want this to happen. Really. Of course. But, you know, I have been sort of viewing, it's like, well, this is, I don't know, like it's my time. I didn't get to choose. And so if this is the thing, then like, that'll be my message. Like, let's cooperate, let's figure it out. I wanna work with everybody like in, in my industry, like top down, bottom up. And I think if we can all try to do that, yeah, a lot better than if we don't. You know? Yeah, so much of that comes down to perspective, right? I mean, yeah. the fact that everybody on the planet has been hit by this thing and adversely in a lot of ways, right? It's hard to sometimes see the silver lining, right? And be able to see that there are some positives that come from it. And hopefully some of this community building that you're talking about can come from the fact that businesses can see as a coalition, right? If they're working together, it makes you stronger, right? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And uh, that, um, and it works in business, whether you have a pandemic or not, right? In, in a society, right? So if there's a collective, yeah, um, and I'm really trying to make sure that I keep my mind and my my eye on that prize too, right? It's easy to kind of look at, oh, wow, less income coming in, there are more bills stacking up, or uh, you look at how futile some things look, you know, if, you, if you're if you seeing how, you know, government is, you know, really having a hard time dealing with the proper way to handle this. Uh, talking to people outside the country really helps me a lot traveling and touring quite a bit i've met amazing business owners and um and yeah music fans that um italy and spain the uk uh, thailand they're all having to navigate this path really the same time that we all are and it'd be one thing if it was an american problem right and you could kind yeah. of you know you can compartmentalize that and use a rule book to kind of come up with a guide for business development and living but it's not it's the entire planet and if you look at the perspective of just as you said, using a community to build things stronger, yeah, we can't be physically right next to each other, arm in arm, kind of doing this thing. But thank God for technology and the ability to kind of network and 
And um, hopefully the relationships that you built leading into this can be really helpful that way too, right? Because, you know, I talked about you walking into a room, you can't walk out of a room without three or four new friends. You've been like this for a long time. And it's fantastic that you and your other partners, man, I know um, Jeep and Jeremy both too, have incredible strengths and the collective that you have at Five Star is unparalleled, right? I mean, in this area, you don't see music stores able to function in that way as really kind of like a three musketeers um, that had the best wishes of the community in mind. You know, the things that I'm amazed by or any businesses that see that the the whole being greater than the sum of its parts that tries to make sure that benefits are, are appointed to, you know, the, the, the minions of the people that are, you know, at every level in, the, in uh, their business. It, the countries that I see that are led by a government that without getting into like a political um, discussion, you look at countries that recognize that the wealth, the health of the people is really the, the foundation that needs to be focused on. You know, I, I'm, I'm, um, I just am encouraged by seeing that because that kind of leadership hopefully carries over in our society too. And it, in a, um, it may be naivete, it may be, you know, sort of a, um, uh, an ignorant way to sort of live my life, but it's what gives me hope, you know, as a father and a business owner. And I just like to know that, um, Collectively, I'm going to continue to work on the positive side of things. I don't want to dwell on what could have been or what should have been. It doesn't do any good, you yeah. know. And I love seeing success stories like yours, man. That you know, uh, you're you're able right now to at least make an upward trajectory. Nothing's going to be perfect, you know. I, I've got a dear friend of mine who talks about uh, progress and not perfection being a sort of a design for living, right? And I'm never going to be Gandhi. I'm never going to be the top, you know, that Everest. But I'll aim for you know some sort of base camps along the way that I can you know emulate people that I admire like Fred Rogers you know like being uh, all accepting and nurturing and Maybe you were as competitive as Gandhi was I mean he was at the kick some ass right <laughs> <laughs> right the backseat to anybody he was going to be the man yeah passive resistance that's right uh, so perspective collective unity, those kinds of things are gonna be really important to get ahead and upward trajectory. So. Yeah, and, and like, dude, to your point, it occurred to me that like, the, the real opportunity, and I know I, this is gonna sound so like, like wishful thinking, but I would like to think that one of the things that people get from this is how interconnected we all are, you know, from continent to continent. Right. You know, it's just this one, blue marble in the middle of nowhere yeah you know like it's all we got and it can be you know through cooperation we can make it a really great place or we can you know keep fighting it up stuff that we maybe don't even need yeah yeah, yeah well more people like you going to congress certainly helps so i appreciate that <clears throat> um yeah i'm gonna take this lighter a, a little bit lighter um yeah, let's do that. Well, I was just going to ask you, you've got uh, some interesting artwork on the walls. So you want to explain your post-it notes and what you've got going on behind you? Uh, well, it's almost, almost embarrassing. So I had this idea that, that I would um, like have these frames on here and that, um, you know, I would just do like, like eight different, you know, pictures of whatever, you know, just this stuff. Uh, like I, I hadn't gotten around to getting the pictures matted. I had a few in mind, but you know, now like I, I've been, I got this place like a year and a half ago and I just never got around to it, but it's kind of creepy without these post-it notes. It's like, you know, living in a model home is weird. Yeah. So one day I decided that I would write on these post-it notes, like things that like were possible, but you know, range from like, really to like, that can't be. <laughs> okay. So what, what I did was like, this is like a Jaffet space station that Jaffet Grammys, like, look, I could, I could probably get a ticket to the Grammys. Yeah. But you know, so many Everest and eh, probably not gonna happen. So the joke has been when people come over, when, if, if they see it, you know, you'll see like mill around and they'll, they'll see it. I say, oh yeah, I have those photos. Just haven't had them matted yet. Right. Like, they already happened. <clears throat> um, I to, love it. The, the, that's the upper trajectory. Everest is within your grasp, I know. 
that I would imagine, honestly, that if you were to look back five years ago, looking at, or I guess nine years ago is when you took over the shop. Is that right? Initially the business? Uh, geez. Uh, well, eight, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So had you thought eight years ago that you'd be weathering the storm of a global pandemic with a successful uh, education merchandising, you know, repair shop probably would not have been, that would have seemed like Everest at that point, I would imagine. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of things where, you know, again, like being a really small shop on the edge of town and kind of growing and, and um, I guess just getting a little bit better seat at the table, so to speak, you know, yeah. and a lot of, a lot of cool experiences too. You know, I mean, like, I, I genuinely love musical instruments and especially guitars and basses, like fretted stringed instruments. And so there's been lots of stuff where like, you know, we'll be getting a chance to see some of those factories and, um, you know, getting to, even just getting to see products ahead of time. is cool. Yeah. No matter how, you know, every once in a while people will say, you know, like, ah, I don't need to go to NAM this year or whatever. Like, I think I sort of get it. But like, for me, it's, I love it. It's super cool. And yeah. everything's different because my role is a little bit different. Sure. You know? I feel like I get better at it. Like I remember the first time I ever went was with you. Yeah. You know, we just got crazy at Disneyland. It was just like this big party. But you know, now it's still just as interesting. It's just, you know, it's a lot more business. But I uh I had my brother with me this this year. He he plays some guitar and we've been kind of bonding over that for a while. But uh, I took him with and you know, like I'd done this enough that it was, it was like dialed. I was like, dude, check it out. We're gonna go to this party. We're gonna go check this out, you know, meet me at this time. And uh, it was a blast. It was like seeing Christmas through the eyes of a child. Oh yeah, anybody's first time at NAMM is unreal, right? They they come away somewhat shocked, surprised, you know, the eyes, stars in their eyes. What? For him, I'm sure too, because you're a freaking rock star. You walk around there and everybody does job bets. I'm sure for him, he's thinking, my God, my brother is the real deal, right? So like- We wound up going to this dinner with, uh, like some of the guys from Alice in Chains. Long story short here, like I got my brother with me and they seat us in and we had like like cooler seats than those guys. <laughs> the, the Alice in Chains guys? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, those guys are right. It was just one of those things where like my brother was like, no oh, shit. You know, like I was like, yeah, stick with me, kid. No. <laughs> yeah. So like luck, it had nothing to do. Like, you know, I just happened to get seated closer to the thing. Um, but yeah, it was, I know it's cool. God, you you were just talking about gear and how excited you are when you get to see some of this new gear. Oh, I think I remember hearing a story about this incredible guitar that you would had your eyes on. Was that from the Nam show that you first saw it? No, no. What happened? Like, okay, so I'd always wanted this this one like Gibson acoustic guitar, a J two hundred. It's so cool, you know. Like, um, and there's so many people that I really dig that had one. Um, and we just recently became a Gibson dealer again. So we did this event with them and they sent some stuff out to sort of supplement what we had in stock. <clears throat> and one of these things was this like really limited version. Like they only made 15 of them last year as it turns out. And so at the end of it, like we had the opportunity for, if we wanted to buy this stuff, like, we could send it back from if we wanted. But I thought, you know, let's buy it. And then like a couple of things kind of came into place and and I was able to get it like like for myself. And it was one of the, the JCT hundred. Uh, I yeah, uh the God, what uh I'll think of it in a second. But yeah, there's a two hundred at the end. <laughs> anyway, point being, like I I haven't been that excited to get a guitar in a long time. Like and in part because you kind of have to have a little bit of a distance, right? Like I always make the analogy, like you don't want to smoke your own stash. Yeah. You know, so you got to like, you know, do, do I really need that? Or is it, you know, and you're constantly like, I really love gears. I'm, I'm, I'm around it all the time. And every day there's something that I could pick up and go, oh, I've always wanted one of those or whatever. Um, so anyway, this was just one of those things where I was like, I think I can pull this off. And yeah, I, I did. And it's been, it's been cool, like, 
you know, you get the, I'm sure like with a new drum set or any new piece of gear, it sort of, you know, gets you thinking in a different way. You know, yeah. It'd be inspiring. It makes you play a little bit different. So yeah, this J200, uh, this killer man. I, well, and you, so last time you were over, I was like, hey, check this out. Yeah. And like, you know, just the way that you do with your friends, like, dude, look at this. Yeah. But man, that, that was that was super cool. It's an incredible guitar. <clears throat> you, have, you have it there in the room? You want to check it out? I want to see it, man. Absolutely. While he's picking this up, I um, I'm going to run through. Uh, I see that there are a whole bunch of comments for John, so I'm going to ask some questions for him in a moment. But uh, um, there are questions. Yeah, there are some comments. Uh, Julie Jacob says that she wants you to put gold records in those frames, but uh, we definitely we've got to give. I got to give huge props to Julie um, for introducing me the first time. I asked her. I said, what's the deal with this Joff Metz guy? His band, Western Ariel, yeah. incredible band, had lots of success around town, but I had seen a bunch of videos of you playing and I said, I gotta beat this guy. And she said, oh, he's a dear friend of mine. Let me make this bromance happen. So the, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a uh, wonderful thing. And I, I wanna give a huge compliment to Julie for being so gracious in that uh, matchmaking. Uh, she's, she's been such a good friend over the years, like yeah. so sweet and like, uh, I don't know. I, you know how it is. Like I, I know her family, and it's just been it's been great. You know. Yeah. No, for sure, man. Yeah, I uh, and I, she she made this shirt for me. So when she asked what I was going to be wearing for an uh, interview, I had to go change my shirt so I could uh, show off my my kiss patch shirt that she made me. That's to me, and I kind of was telling you about this, and it, it was like, hey, you know, good luck or whatever. And they're like, you know, what are you wearing for the thing? I just didn't have time. Uh, you know. Not that I won't get back to you eventually, but now I know what she was talking about. She just wanted me to wear that shirt that she gave. Yeah. But did she, she didn't tell you to put pants on though. So thankfully you're- Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh. Uh, <laughs> look, look at this guitar, my God. Do you mind holding it up to the camera? I gotta see what makes this thing special. This is, it's so cool. So like, it's this, like the, the biggest guitar that- the, Wow. You know, that the big thing was like, um, you know, it sounds great, it plays cool and it's awesome. But you know, the big thing is like, you know, Pete Townsend had one and, uh, you know, like, uh, this is the same guitar that uh, Here Comes the Sun was recorded on. Really? Well, I mean, not this particular one. Oh, right, but yeah. same, same model. And there's, there's a million like cool, like Elvis had some and Johnny Cash and all these guys. And so it's just sort of imprinted on your mind, like, like, ah, oh, that's super cool. And I played him before, I just never really had a chance. And so like, for me, it was just this opportunity to like, you know, we were working with Gibson again and this really cool, unique piece came through that things just happened to line up and I was able to pick it up and I was like, all right, I'm going to take that and I'm going to make some cool records with it. And, and that's my plan, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. And I, I think it'll be almost like a trophy of, of the times, you know, that like, more than just going to pick it out it represented like this whole thing you know and the relationship with those guys and getting a chance to uh to work with gibson again i'm actually like pretty excited about what they're doing these days gibson uh, now i get off on a tangent of that but <clears throat> you know they, they were they did some restructuring like brand kind of got a little uh, uh off the rails they kind of lost their way a little bit um but you know they, they make some of the coolest guitars ever and I, I've been a big fan. Like I, I got a I got a Gibson SG tattooed on. My oh head. yeah. Um. So anyway, man, it's it's been cool and stuff like that. It's just I don't know. It's so much fun to me, like to be involved and to know more about it. Yeah. You know, I, I, it works. Are they still making the acoustics in Bozeman? <clears throat> yeah. They are in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. My hometown. Wow. Yeah, man. Uh, matter of fact, like, uh, I really want to go out there and check it out one of these days. So, um, you know, that's right. That's road trip. Well, uh, right. Uh, I'll go to the uh, Kevin Rankin Museum there. Yeah. <laughs> that's called jail. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I was never incarcerated in Bozeman, just so anybody knows. But I, uh, before you play something, I want to make sure that, uh, oh, Dane Ryan wants to know if he can return his egg shaker to Five Star. Like, uh, uh, do you still have the receipt? Yeah, return the microphone. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, let me, don't put that guitar down. That was just a couple of quick, quick comments that uh, popped in. When, Read the comments. Well, what, I want to know what you're going to play. What are you going to play for us? Ah, well, I mean, I, uh, you know, the, the old voice is uh, a little rough. Um, uh, well, how about some more questions? Uh, well, the uh, most of them were comments about the store. I think uh, Lisa Anderson was talking about furloughing the school district right now. Um, she's just commiserating, right? That the, the that uh, I think everybody's being affected in schools as well. And it's tough, right? That I would imagine some of the kids that you're teaching right now through the Zoom lessons have had their schedules uprooted, right? There's no every, like kids are so dependent on structure, right? And you know maybe they don't want that, but right now with no structure in their life. Zoom classes. Um, are you guys noticing that the student lessons have picked up? Are they sliding? Or tell me about that a little bit. Well, I think that the uh, retention has been pretty good, and we we actually did pick up some students. I think initially, people thought like, well, you know, maybe I'll just hold off for now. Um, you know, right when this happens, like mm -hmm. in March, but then. I think when folks realized that it was going to be a long time, you know, and this wasn't going to be over on April 1st, right. Um, that they realized this was an opportunity to, to keep that schedule and keep some normalcy and just give people something to do. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I've been, I've been doing the same thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm playing some bands and, you know, I have that outlet on a regular basis and I got a chance to, <clears throat> you know, not only play the shows, but rehearse and, um, you know, and we're recording some stuff with MRC and, uh, and I'll tell you about all that stuff in a minute. But the thing that was like, I realized after a few weeks, it was like, I really miss that. I really, yeah. miss, you know, Tuesday night rehearsals. I really miss seeing my friends and having that, like, um, that outlet for it. <clears throat> and so, you know, I've been, I've been trying to figure out like, you know, by harnessing the technology that's available, you know, I've been writing some with um, Mike and Dane and, you know, I had a buddy send over a track and I just added like a, a guitar part to it and sent it back to him, you know, so that kind of stuff's been cool. Um, but, you know, I did some playing this morning and it was great, you know, and like, I, I, I've known this for a long time, but I, I have to keep it in mind too. Like you get so busy with your business and you, whatever it is that you feel like you have to do, mm -hmm. that's you don't take care of yourself. And for me, like for my own sanity, like I, I gotta play. Yeah. And I have to have that outlet. And so, you know, I, I was working on something this morning. I mean, just like a song that I really liked and I was coming up with like, like a, 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 another way to play it, you know? And, had this really great idea of sort of changing the feel of this great song and it was you know be a cool thing for me to do like like sort of my, in my my own voice and it was so much fun to have that like oh this is a great idea i gotta record this you know and like working on it you know it's like it's so much fun and same yeah. way with songwriting even if it's yourself you know and i i want to do more of it and I, i'm realizing like the other people I was just talking about, like once you realize this is going to be on for a while, that was one of the things that I just have made more of a commitment in the last couple of weeks to do. I need to do that. It'll make me happier and make me not lose sight of it. Like yeah. at the end of the day, I didn't do any of this to not play my guitar. I was quite sure. able to do it more, you know? And so, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm really excited about recent events with regard to the store. Yeah. I'm excited about what music's gonna happen as a result of this. And um, I, I will tell you like, if there was a silver lining in, in all these shows being canceled, uh, canceled and all these things, it, at least I will say this, when they do open back up, I'll never take another one for granted. Yeah, Not, man. Like, I like to think that I, I, I try to be really present and I try to be really grateful. And I think about that all the time even just with my own health now. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that could be could be worse. But, um, you know, like we were playing regularly as All the time. 
So are you, man. Sure. And, and, and doing like for you stuff that like, it was really sort of the apex, like big shows. Like, man, the, the, that show that I saw you play at the, uh, was it the Honda Center in Anaheim? Oh yeah, that's right. You were down there for that. Yeah, that was, it was such a fun night. And, um, you know, I mean, that's gotta be rough. Like there, you, you, you'd gotten to that point where you're playing like big arenas and stuff. And I remember seeing that and being like, dude, that's my boy. You know? Yeah. I was excited to have you there too. It's fun to share that. Yeah. Tough to have the rug pulled out from under you a little bit. Right. Yeah. Well, right. Right. And, um, you know, I mean, it, like everybody, it's been, uh, certainly lost money. Like my income's not what it once was, but I have different streams of revenue, you know, because I'm mm. teaching a little bit and, and the shop is you know, still, still going. Um, and I really, really feel like I could, so many people as do you, but even so many folks just here in Portland, uh, my bandmates, some of them, you know, yeah. that's all they do. Yeah. That's, so, you know, like, um, you know, if their church gig is canceled and all the, you know, other stuff is finished and, and how many people like in the service industry, like, Oh my God. You know, that kind of stuff. There were all the people that work at the clubs that we, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been rough and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, you know, moving past it. It's just, you know, trying to be very Zen about it and look for the opportunities in it. Trying to. You know, you talk about not taking it for granted, right? And that's one thing that maybe we're all guilty of, you know, you're, if you're playing regularly and you're appreciative that people come out and support you and you might be appreciative of the venues that you're playing at, the people that kind of take care of you. But at the end of the day, knowing that all of these people are affected, patrons, club owners, you know, security, your bandmates, all these people are struggling at the same time. It does help you appreciate, I think, everybody else's plight. And then you don't want to take any of those things for granted. When we can get up and going again, it makes the gig that much more fulfilling, right? So, I, Exactly. And yeah. we can look for opportunities. You know, I don't know what those clubs are going to need um, to get back on their feet. I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, the other people in the in the live music industry that I work with, but you know, where I can, I want to try to help them. You bet. Me, like we can all sort of help each other stand back up together. So you know, like I think we can make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of that is just communication too. You know, staying in touch with these places and making sure that if there is some way to support these places, that we do that now. I, uh, I would love to know, but there's something that you feel like the community could give back to Five Star right now, you know, whether it be supporting these students or the, um, the presentations you guys do, it would be nice to know because you've done so much for the community. Is there anything that Five Star could use in terms of like a little support? Okay, well, all right, all right. Look, um, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, and so I don't have, all of the answers that I might have in the coming weeks, but we'll definitely try to communicate that. Um, we're, we're still selling stuff online um, and we're starting to bring people back to help us do that so that we can be even more efficient about it. But we, we've gotten a lot of, um, you know, great support from people over the last six weeks. Um, and it's been great to hear, you know, people are, I think very patient. They recognize the fact that we just don't have the kind of turnaround time. Yeah. That that it's, you know, with special orders, you know, it's difficult, whatever, but um, it's going to get better. And the outpouring of support that we've seen so far is really touching. And it makes the long days easier to deal with when you're able to help, you know, uh, folks of a longtime student get a guitar for that student's birth. Mm -hmm whatever, you know, and, and realizing that you're making an impact. Like, that's cool. It's what keeps us going. And um, so that's still going. We're still offering curbside pickup and starting uh, Monday, we're going to bring our Luthier Ian back. So we're going to start doing repairs again. Okay. So it, it's going to expand. And then at sometime in the next few weeks, after we've kind of got the things that we need to, to really come out, I mean, as, as much as I'd like to just open the doors, there's a lot more to it. We mm -hmm. we be very responsible about uh, you know how we deal with that, um, but 
we're working on a plan. We're going to get to it. And as soon as we do, we'll make that announcement and, and try to broadcast it to everybody. Cool. They could probably stay in touch with you through your socials. They can go to Five Star Guitars. Yeah, so fivestarguitars.com. And it's all spelled out. So it's F-I-V-E, star, guitars, plural. Um, and check us out on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and bunch of other stuff yeah that's it's important man I, I i'm really proud to see the success that you've done you know that you had with the store and it's really been a testament to your tenacity and your diligence and in, in making it work so it's it, it i you know i saw dave bowen actually posted that he got a killer microphone from you yesterday at the shop so yeah yeah, yeah. well that, that was cool too it was another one like you know as an example dave hits me up and he's like hey man i wanted a few things you know and it, it, you know, Dave's an old pal of ours. Yeah. <clears throat> Happy to, to get him the stuff. And, and he was super patient. You know, I had to tell him, I was like, Hey man, I got to call these guys and see who's shipping and who's not. I mean, you know, lots of stuff like that, that normally wouldn't be a big deal. Like every sure. other hours, I know what they can do. Um, but you know, he was super patient. It was cool. And I helped him get some stuff that I think he's going to really dig. And that's yeah. I, ultimately, that's what it's all about. You know? Yeah. Like, or you or anybody in town anybody that's shopping with us even online you know we just we just want to help people get into the stuff that they're going to dig yes i mean that is definitely one of the things that sets you guys apart you know you just don't find that kind of personal service from any kind of big chain store that's it's nice to see you know and and gear not just guitars man he got the microphone from you but i know that you've got a, a stock of some drums and and uh you know cymbals and you know uh, other recording equipment right so you know, like the thing of it is, um, oh, you, <laughs> that, that was that was that was Julie's gift. There. Thanks, Jules. Well, thank you for your service there. You know? <laughs> right. Congrats and the kiss family. Um, so uh, yeah, like um, I, I, I would say this is like a blanket statement. If you're looking for something music-wise, let me know. Because like, you know, we might not sell bagpipes, but I can probably refer you to somebody that does. Um, and same way with like service and lessons and whatever, like, you know, we don't really have like um, uh, a trombone teacher, but mm -hmm. looking, I probably point you in the right direction. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the, the overarching thing. Like we try to be a hub for like musical activity there. Yeah. If you if you want something like let me know you bet um, you know i mean we can usually meet or beat whatever the price is and get you the stuff but it's it's really about the service pre and post you know yeah um and you know thinking about it long term and like the, the stuff we, for dave like one of the considerations was like the stuff that he got was like if you wanted to expand down the road you can do it with yeah you know, you don't need any more than this for right now, based on what you, you know, you were working on. <clears throat> but I, I want to keep that in mind that down the road, you might want to expand or um, do whatever, modify how you're using this. And we want to make sure that it's stuff that you do with. Um, and I think those are the kind of things that, um, that it, it's, it's more of an experience. It's not just getting stuff. It's, yeah getting the stuff, understanding how to use it and, and having people there that if you got questions about it later, or if there's a, an issue and you need to contact the manufacturer, or, you know, whatever, like come as he is. It's one of the great things about working so closely with them and being like the repair center for a lot of places is that, you know, I mean, like if we can't fix it, we're, we're directly in line with them and we can make it happen. Um, so I, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of people out there that are looking for opportunities to shop local and to support the community, you know, and then that's the difference. So like all that money, like everything that's made stays right here because right. everybody's rent puts food on the table. Absolutely. Uh, you know, but th there's definitely like a, a service that comes along with that. So yeah. developing the relationship with that community is just important. You know, anybody that feels like absolutely uh, my, my boy Joff at Five Star Guitars hooked me up. That's exactly how Dave reached out and said, hey, my buddy, you know, it, like Joff got me this guitar or this microphone yesterday having a name and a face to that uh, transaction was more than just going down and buying a car off a lot, right? You felt like this experience he got was something that you developed a relationship, something he's going to stay with forever, and he's more likely to refer you, right? So word of mouth is an important uh, tag along with that. 
Absolutely, man. And, you know, so many folks have been great about that and, and sharing it too, you know. Um, I mean, that, that's the, I think awareness is the, our biggest opportunity. Yeah. You know, like if everybody knew what we were doing and knew that it was just, you know, down the road a piece, um, you know, it, it could be, it could be even bigger than it is and still maintain that kind of feel. You bet. You know, the challenge too is that as we get bigger, how do you, how do you keep it that same feel where you feel like you know somebody? Yeah. You can talk to them on a first name basis and you can get your questions answered and, and just have a, a community like that, like a place where you can stop off and just check stuff out, see what's mm-hmm. new, hi to people that you know. The neighborhood music shop. Totally. You, well, you've gotten a bunch of awards, right? From the state of Oregon, right? For business, right? Yeah, in um, in 2016, uh, my partners and I were named the Small Business Persons of the Year in the state of Oregon. And like at the time, I didn't even like I didn't realize like what a sort of a big deal that was. But you know, one day I'm selling strings at the shop, and the next day, you know, I was at the uh, like in D.C. accepting an award. You know, I'm um, at the Smithsonian and Mark. Wow. Keith- trophy wow so like that that was really cool and it it meant a lot and we were the first music store to ever win that ever yeah God. yeah i want to say that that it that award was first given out like in like 64 or something like that i think wow president at the time um and we researched it and nobody could find otherwise um and you know so it's I have since met, like it's on my, uh, it's on my business card. I've since met a few people that noticed that and either had somebody that they knew that had won it for their state in, in years past uh, or they themselves had done it, you know? Wow. It's been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. small company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know, um, are you familiar with uh, Electroharmonics? The, those, uh, the, the, it's an effects manufacturer. Okay. Oh, uh, I've seen EH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so he's like, um, you know, like a pioneer of, of these effects and, you know, was doing stuff like 50 years ago, was making like Big Muff and stuff like that. I wound up on an email thread with him and he saw that on my, the signature line of my email. And it turns out that in the mid 70s, he had won that same award for the state of New York. <clears throat> and it started this, this wow. real conversation about like, all right, well, you know, next time you're in New York, you know, look me up kind of thing. And it was just, I don't know, it was really cool. Uh, that that it, it meant a lot. And actually, I, I totally have like the, uh, the letter from those guys like framed on my wall over there. It was huge. It was, it was such a big deal as I realized later, you know, but when, when we were nominated and when it all went down, like, I, I, you know, at the time I was just busy doing my thing and, happy to talk with people, you know, uh, about it and about what we're doing. But, um, so that, that was huge. And then like, um, we won some awards from NAM, um, which is the, uh, the trade group that's kind of oversees musical instruments, uh, the distribution and, and sales and manufacturing. <clears throat> and, um, that's cool too, you know, like there's nothing better than just like the people you meet day to day and you're, you know, you're helping them out, but yeah. To have somebody like in the industry, you know, like like the guys themselves to say like, you've done a really good job. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, like in 2018, we won the uh, the award for like best store turnaround. And you, you, they're taking applications for this like all over the world. I mean, like big stores. Wow. And not even just like in the US, <clears throat> you know, but like I, the, the night that we won that, um, the, the dealer of the year was Anderton's in the UK, right? It was okay. a huge guitar shop. And, you know, uh, it, it, it meant a lot. It was just cool. And again, like a, like a seat at that table. Like, it, it's a long way from where we started. Yeah. In, you know, like a converted carport. Right. Uh, to, you know, being there in, in Nashville and hanging out with those guys. So, you know, th- that kind of stuff... It means a great deal and i feel like those were wins like not just for us but like for sure for like our employees yeah 
you know, there was like a, a real big sense of pride with that because they contributed to something that was really, really doing something for the whole industry, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think it was a big win for our customers too. Like, you know, we've all seen those, whether, whether it's like a band that you see and they're just <clears throat> playing a Wednesday night at the street saloon or whatever. And then, and then they go on to get bigger and, and have success. And you're like, Hey, I helped those, you know, I bought their first record. Out yeah. of <clears throat> I feel like it's kind of the same way with the, uh, with, with our customers too. When we get recognized in that way, it's, you know, they, they were onto it. Yeah, absolutely. Their support. So it's, it's a win for everybody. It's, it's, it's cool. It's cool that you share that success and the recognition with them and the employees, man, that, uh, that's, that's special. I saw all these comments. Some Bo Metz guy says he wants to know where his guitar is. Um, the uh, my brother. Uh, huh. Yeah, like you knew that we we're gonna have a heckle, right, um, from him. Um, let's see, let's, I just uh, saw that uh, Nathaniel Vile. Let's see. He says, "What do you think about the Pentagon releasing photos of the UFOs?" So I, I didn't know we were gonna go that route, but. Uh, <laughs> like, um, we can talk about that, but I, I, I just thought of something else. The crazy stories, crazy experiences. We played the prison. You and I. <laughs> like, um, I oh, and I saw Molly McKenzie. Says uh, nice to see her faces. So um, uh, Jimmy, man, the, uh, the 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 incredible bassist from Western Ariel, miss his uh, smiling mug too. But oh, right on. Molly just jumped on here. But yeah, we the three of us played at Oregon State Penitentiary. Yeah, what, what a yeah, what an intense deal. Um, you know, when, when we got the offer, like, you gotta say yes, you know, gotta Johnny Cash. And, and it, there actually is like a, a long history of music in U S prisons. And, and even at the one in, uh, in Salem, like Stevie Ray Vaughan had played there right. and a bunch of other people. Um, so it was cool, but man, it's a, that's an intense place, you know, Gosh, yeah. how is anybody <clears throat> but you know the the one thing about it that like as we were getting processed in is you, you know you go through a series of doors to finally get into the main yard there and <clears throat> there's like a cement block and um you know uh, you you see it and it's like well that's where steve ray vaughn played and jerry garcia and george thorgood and all, all these people that had had come through and played uh in that spot right in front of all these prisoners um, um, and, and you realize like like there's no quick way out right and that you're there on probably the happiest day of the year absolutely and so you know it, it it meant a lot to be able to do that at first just for bragging rights like right a, a prison you know yeah. like, like me metallica johnny <laughs> Cash, a few people rocking you know right but like uh what i kind of got out of it later was again that sort of recognizing that that is probably the happiest day because for a minute you know that music is there and yeah. otherwise it's a pretty quiet pretty dark place and when we were there it was a sunny day yeah playing some music and i think for a minute you know you could close your eyes and be someplace else and uh, you know, they they made us those posters. I I actually have one framed on my wall in here. So you do. I was hoping to get a copy of that. Can you send me just a picture of that? I'd love to have a copy of that. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Um. So you know, but but that that poster was like hand drawn by those guys. That's right. Yeah, a lot of time on their hands, and they were just stoked. Mm -hmm. to, you know, make like a poster that they were kind of passing out and they gave us a copy. <clears throat> so, you know, th that was cool. I mean, an, an opportunity that uh, really glad that we had a chance to do. And, and yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. That's like when you finally get out, you know, it's just so, you're like so drained because there's so much like adrenaline, like you have to be really aware of where you're at. And it's not to say that they don't take good care of you. Right. You know, yeah. But you know, you sign an agreement recognizing the fact that they don't negotiate for hostages. Right. You know, you, if the only, the only thing separating us from them was those cones. Right. 
the high traffic cones with like twine. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I remember those uh, folks in there were like, they would want us to sign stuff, you know? Right. And you realize that if they, you know, if they pull you over that thing, yeah, you know, you're on your own. Game over. But I, everybody was super nice to us when we were in there. And, and again, I, I think it was genuinely appreciated. And even, yeah. <clears throat> even the, the, the guys that were like, you know, vast majority of folks out there right in front of us and, and doing the thing and <clears throat> have that kind of concert feel, but there were lots of other people doing their thing. And it's not, I don't think that they were disinterested, but that's also the, like their only hour of the day or whatever they get to go outside. Right. And so to be able to run around the track or, you know, play basketball, there's that basketball court behind us. Right. You know, and, and to have some, some music and just some positive vibes in there, like, that's cool. You know, we made a difference that day and it was a cool thing to be able to do. And it puts us one step closer to Johnny Cash. That's right, man. Yeah. You know what, your perspective about the effect that you left those guys, like the, the dudes that were in there that really had this one break that their reality was kind of interrupted for a second to just have a respite. Totally. That's truly what people get when they come out to your shows. You know, I think that's one thing that people are missing right now. In a sense, they're all confined, right? They're all, in car, you know, um, captive, yeah. right? And people are quarantined. And a lot of times people are just yearning for that experience of, walking into a club or venue and watching Joff and Dan and Mike Collins and the gang, you know, doing your thing. I um, I think having just a tiny respite, a little bit of a break with music would be a fantastic way to sort of play this out tonight. I'd love to see you big, pick up that gorgeous Gibson guitar and give uh, give people just a little bit of an escape from that, uh, yeah. the, the confines of their captive home. What do you think? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm down, let's see, can you grab a... Okay, but pick. I got, I got. I finally wore pants for the first time in some. <laughs> nice change. While uh, Joff is picking up his guitar, I was going to let you guys know um, there are a handful of fun conversations coming up in the next eleven days. I think we've got this happening every day. Uh, so tomorrow night, let's see. I'll give you a little quick rundown. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Sunday night, we've got an all access uh, conversation with Phil Buckman, bass player from Fuel. He was in Filter. He's the voice of NBC News and Carl's Jr. And uh, also plays with the band Petty Cash, which is a great tribute to Johnny Cash and Tom Betty. And uh, you've seen them on a ton of TV and movies too. So uh, that's tomorrow night. Monday night, we've got Terry Finley, beautiful friend, tour manager for Pat Benatar and Brian Setzer. And uh, Chicago, Little River Band, everybody in between. Uh, Tuesday night, we've got uh, dear friend Luke Duran, who is not only my former bandmate from Montana, but is also the art director for Montana Outdoors Magazine. And uh, he plays in a great band called The Mighty Flick out there. Uh, Wednesday night, we've got an Alexis part two conversation with Glenn Sobel, uh, drummer, drummer for Alice Cooper, and uh, another homie that uh, Joff is well familiar with. Uh, with uh, some crazy exploits that we've had together in LA. Thursday night, Ed Souza, an amazing promoter in uh, Toronto, a guy that's brought uh, Flock of Seagulls up a bunch of times and uh, he does so much work with charity. His, uh, his donations for Ronald McDonald House over the last several years have made a huge difference. Raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for Ronald McDonald House, all uh, under the uh, umbrella of doing good things with music. Friday night, All Access Live with our buddy, Eddie Martinez. Um, so yeah, um, Joff's known Eddie for a long time. Eddie was uh, the guitarist for Robert Palmer, Rod Stewart, everybody in between. Hundreds of bands, uh, album credits with uh, uh, crazy amounts of Grammy award-winning records and uh, almost everything you heard come out the 70s, 80s, 90s from the New York uh, recording scene had Eddie playing guitar on it. So from Eat Him and Smile, or no, Crazy from the Heat, the David Lee Roth record, to uh, uh, Run DMC, Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell, just everything under the sun he was recording. So he'll be Friday night. Yeah. Uh, set, Saturday the 9th, we've got uh, Rob McLean, uh, amazing bassist and uh, um, sign shop operator from Montana in a butte, old former bandmate, dear friend of mine. And then uh, Sunday, wrapping up that week, a week from tonight, 
or a week from tomorrow night, we've got uh, Damone, Bob Romanos, uh, Robert Romanos uh, from uh, Damone. You'll know him from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And so that'll be a, a fun conversation. We'll talk a little bit about Bob and um, it goes on and on from there. We've got all sorts of stuff happen the next couple of weeks, but that's the uh, rundown for the next week. And now to wrap this thing up tonight, to give you guys a little bit of a, uh, a nice send off for Saturday night, Mr. Joff Metz and his beautiful new Gibson guitar. Yeah, new guitar day. Um, all right, after this though, you gotta tell me how you met Damone. That's such a cool story. Okay, you got all it. Right, let's do it. Cheers, you guys. Left you feeling scared out alone, please know you can call me. I'll be there right away, dry the tears as you lay all on me. We can get in your car, drive away, and leave it all behind. We could stare at the sky, holding hands to see what we could find. Up tonight on the light horizon, you're all I can think about tonight on the light horizon. We're all we can see. Now there's a pain in the chest. How we get in this mess in the first place? Our lines were crossed in a no cost me my head space I gave you my heart and my hand but you wanted my soul and you said that is just as well so I've been told but tonight on the light horizon you're all I Think about tonight on the light horizon. We all we can see. Oh, it's alright if you're scared. Don't get that way. And it's alright if you get and give it all away. It's alright if you can't stay where you are And it's alright if you leave and won't be that far Hey! So if you're wondering if I've changed my mind I'm still feeling the same Would I still run away, change my name and start all over again? You can look at the stars I know somewhere I'm looking at to Dreaming away if things could have been different with you But tonight on the light horizon You're all I can think about tonight on the light horizon we all we can see you at night on the light horizon. You're all I can think about tonight on the light horizon. We all we can see you at night on the light horizon. On the light horizon. That was my that was my tambourine rattle. Hey. Beautiful, man, beautiful. That's great, man. You, Guitar sounds can't fantastic. I love it. I love it, man. Joff Metz, um, I just miss playing with you, buddy. I do. We Indeed. Made it'll happen again. It's rock and roll records. Everybody needs more Joff Metz in their life for sure. You would ask me about uh, Damone. I'm gonna save that story for when I talk to him next week. So you're just gonna have to tune in and find out. 
but uh, it's, it's a fun one. He's a good dude. Uh, listen, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to just catch back up, man. I, uh, I really have been thinking about you a lot. I appreciate you sharing the information about uh, what Five Star is doing and, uh, you know, your attention to just focus on keeping your uh, uh, support for businesses local is a really important thing as a community. You got us together, man. We've, uh, we've got this thing. Ab absolutely. And, you know, and let's, let's everybody try to keep the, the communication open. You know, like yeah. things are going to get better. We can do this. We can work through it together. And, um, you know, like we can do it. Absolutely. As long as, we work, as long as we do it together, man. Absolutely. I love it. Hey, man. Thank you for your time. Have a beautiful weekend. I hope you guys, if you're listening out there, uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Just take care of each other, man. Take care of uh, your peeps. And uh, come back and hang with love. We'll do this again. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks, my friend. Give my best to Jan, all right? Will do. I love you, man. Take care. Love you, too. Have a great night. Okay. You, too.